Blessed Tuesday to all of you. Welcome to TNT, our Tuesday noon teaching, whether you're joining us at noon or at night on Tuesday or another day of the week. It's always a delight to have you sharing with us. Get your Bible, whatever means by which you're going to take notes for today. It's going to be a wonderful, blessed time of study together. But of course, we have to start with prayer. And so we welcome all of you wherever you are joining us. And we want to just pray together for just a moment. If you have a prayer request, place it in the chat, in the comment section. We'll pray as a community of faith unto the Lord because he knows what we need and he knows how to answer our prayers, all right? We're always praying for our church, pastor, pastor's family, officers, uh, leaders, staff, all of our members and our world uh, because our world needs prayer, all right? Let's bow. Dear God, our Father, we thank you for being who you are and who you are to us. And we're grateful that you are merciful and kind and forgiving and loving and patient, that you are all knowing and all powerful, that you are everywhere at the same time so that there is no place that we could ever be where you are absent. Thank you for who you are, for your character, for your nature. We welcome the presence of your Holy Spirit into our midst wherever we are as we, O oh God, participate in this Bible study. Forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, settle us down, put us on one accord with you and even with others so that we, O oh God, might not allow anything with anyone and certainly nothing within ourselves to disrupt what it is that you desire to achieve this day. I pray in Jesus' name that you would hear our prayers, prayers for ourselves, prayers for family members, prayer for friends, those other concerns that are on our hearts, matters of justice and injustice, matters that relate to the politics of this world, uh, the state of our nation in the United States of America and other nations that are viewing us on this occasion, I pray that wherever we are in the world, that you, O God, would intervene and intercept, that you, O God, would hear prayers of the righteous. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would show yourself mighty and show yourself strong so that the world might look to you as the true King of kings and the Lord of lords. We pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would be our leader and our guide and our teacher to lead and guide us into all truth. And I pray that you would give us receptive hearts and then active wills and hands so that as a result of this study today and this series of lessons that we, oh God, will experience a resurgence, a restoration, and if need be, a resurrection of our hope 
that ultimately is in you. We love you. We trust you. And we thank you. Don't allow any mess in me to mess up the ministry and the message that you desire to share this day to the end that miracles happen. And we, oh God, will give you glory. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the reason for our hope, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, welcome to this week's study. We're in a brand new series of lessons, and I have uh, been led of God to borrow from the Reverend Jesse L. Jackson Sr. from the time in which he was running for the presidency of the United States of America, and he said to all of us something that many of us continue to say to this day, keep hope alive. And so that is the focus of our series for the next several weeks that we're going to focus on hope because the Holy Spirit has impressed upon me that there's so many of us that are dealing with um, hopes that have been impacted by life and life's vicissitudes that we need our hopes restored and our hopes strengthened again and our hopes bolstered again so that we can experience how powerful hope really is. And so grab your Bible and let's turn again to Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 12. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 12. I'm going to read out of the New International Version. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 12. I encourage you to read along with me, um, even out loud, as we commence this time of study together. And this is how Solomon writes these words. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Again, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And so as we embrace this whole idea about hope, Solomon actually provides us with some type of contextual perspective on the power of hope and the need for hope. So what we did last time was that we began simply by sharing a few definitions and descriptions of hope. So we talked about how hope is that feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. That hope is a person or a thing in which expectations are centered. Hope is to look forward to something with desire and reasonable confidence. That hope is to believe, to desire, or trust. Sometimes we may say, I hope that things will work out. I hope that this will happen or will not happen. To hope is to have that sense of feeling on the inside that causes desire to become strong where you really desire something to happen. Biblically, the Greek word in the New Testament for hope is elpis. By the way, the word hope in the Bible, uh, particularly in the King James Version, appears somewhere around 130 times. And so the number of occurrences of the word hope or hoped or hopeth uh, in the King James in some occasions um, suggests to us that hope is an important thing an important reality for all of us and particularly those of us of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. And so the Greek word in the New Testament is Elpis. E-L-P-I-S is the English transliteration. Elpis. It's spelled just the way it sounds. E-L-P-I-S in English. And that word Elpis means favorable and confident expectation, favorable and confident expectation. It has to do with the unseen that has an accompanying expectation of the future, that you can't see it all, but you still expect even more than you can see, all right? Um, it most frequently 
has attached to it the idea of happy anticipation of good, right? Well, you're not just anticipating good. You are happily anticipating good, right? That's hope. When you understand it, it suggests to us that we are excited about what can and will happen in our future, right? That is helping to preserve us and that is helping to strengthen us in our present, no matter what our present reality may be, all right? And so when you understand this, you understand as well that when we talk about hope, uh, you can't separate hope from faith. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one, reminds us now faith is the substance of things what? That's right, hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You see how that whole unseen thing is always attached to hope and even to faith? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for because I hope, now I believe. And the evidence of things not seen, right? You put a little time on it, things are going to turn around, okay? And so when we framed this last week, we framed it with these underpinnings, these descriptions, these definitions of hope. And when we understand it in the biblical context, then hope becomes the ground upon which our hope is based. In other words, the ground, the foundation for our hope is always based on something, right? There's an object of our hope just as there is an object of our faith. We hope in something or in someone. We put our faith in someone or in something, all right? And so when you understand this, then you understand the nature of hope. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul writes to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right. I'll probably repeat that again in our study today because it's going to coincide with one of the movements of our lesson today. Hope, Emily Dickinson would say, is that thing with feathers that perches itself in the soul and sings tunes without words and never stops at all. Remember the image from last week that, that I helped you to see, I hope, <laughs> uh, is a bird perched in a tree, right? You wake up in the morning, you hear the singing of birds, the birds are perched in the tree, and they are singing. They're singing melodies. They are seemingly happy melodies. They don't sound sad at all. The birds are chirping. They're glad to be alive. They're looking at nature. They're looking at all that God has created. And you wake up to these sounds. You don't hear any words, but you hear these tunes, these melodies that they just keep on singing and it doesn't stop. That is the picture. That's the image that Emily Dickinson paints for us as it relates to hope. That hope purchases itself in the heart and sings without words and never stops at all. In other words, no matter what it looks like, hope keeps singing, all right? In Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, I shared with you his story of how his family was killed in uh, Nazi Germany's concentration camps in Auschwitz and Dachau and how he survived the Holocaust, and when he was interviewed, he said that the thing that kept him and his colleagues alive was that they never lost the quality of hope. So you have to keep hope alive because hope will keep you alive. They never lost their quality of hope. No matter how much suffering they went through, they still kept hope alive and hope kept them alive. And so we ended last week on that dialectical tension that manifests hope in the Negro spirituals. 
and the Negro spiritual in particular that we identified was that Negro spiritual, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows my sorrow, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, glory, hallelujah. Nobody knows the trouble I see, nobody knows but Jesus, nobody knows the trouble I see, glory, hallelujah, right? So they acknowledge the reality of pain, of suffering, of difficulty, and yet they also, in the same song, acknowledge hope with two powerful words, glory, hallelujah. They weren't celebrating their pain. They were not celebrating their suffering. They were not celebrating their agony. They were not celebrating their oppression. What they were doing was acknowledging it, but then turning right around and saying, but it's not going to have the last word over my life. I've got hope that this thing is going to turn around and the one in whom I place my hope causes me to celebrate in advance and say glory, hallelujah, right? And so that brings us to today's focus and that is the birth of hope, why we need it. And I won't be able to exhaust it, but I just wanna dabble with it just a little bit because the tension in that Negro spiritual helps us to understand that there are context in life that are the birthplace, the breeding ground, if you will, for hope. That we wouldn't have reason for hope, that we would not know hope if it weren't for certain circumstances in our lives that we must face that help to birth what hope really is. All right, remember, Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 12, Solomon says that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Langston Hughes, as you know, I've quoted him many times. Many of you have read him and quoted him many times with that poem, A Dream Deferred. Um, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust over and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode, right? Hope sometimes is birth out of contexts that are not pleasant, right? So when you read scripture, um, scripture helps us here to put this in perspective. What do you mean? Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25. You can turn there in your Bibles. Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25. Paul writes, for in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. So Paul speaks of hope in a way that says to us that you don't need hope if you have everything that you need. And if you can see everything, that's possible. The way you discover hope and the reason that you need hope is when you find yourself in deficits. <laughs> when you find yourself in despair, that is where and that is when and that is how you discover what hope really is. So perhaps we should pause for just a moment and we should thank God for the emergence, the birth, the arrival, the realization of hope that we would not realize if it weren't for some of the circumstances of our present and or past. 
And so I, I want to suggest today that hope is born out of and the need for it is created out of a minimum of four realities. And I use very, very broad strokes to paint this picture here um, to be more descriptive than prescriptive. All right. And so remember, Solomon is our anchor here. A hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Right. And so then where does hope come from? How is hope born, birthed? Well, I want to suggest that there are at least four ways that hope is born. And there are four reasons the same that we need hope. All right. First of all, hope is born out of pain. It comes from pain. All right. Um, professors uh, Sylvia Kiesmott and Brian J. Walsh address the link between hope and suffering in their commentary on the book of Romans. And they argue that lament, crying, tears, sorrow, is an act of hope. In fact, it is an act of passionate expectation. Hope is always born of lament. They say what they're basically suggesting to us is, is that hope and suffering are linked. That it is our suffering, our pain, our difficulty, our disappointment that helps to facilitate the emergence of hope in our lives. Because our sufferings and our pains and our difficulties and our disappointments make clear what we don't have but wish we did have. We don't have relief. We don't have a pain-free body. We don't have a heart that hasn't been hurt, right? Whatever the case may be, there's something that we're going through that has exposed a deficit and a thing that we lack, but simultaneously, it gives birth to the hope, the expectation, the forward look to experiencing what we don't have, which suggests that there's a hope, there's a belief, there's a faith that that thing is possible. I hope this is, this is making a little bit of sense. Somehow, God produces hope from the trials pains, sufferings, and disappointments of life. Yeah, we wouldn't know what hope is if we didn't have trials, pains, sufferings, and disappointments in this life, all right? The pains and the perplexities of life cause us to look for a bright side somewhere. <laughs> I grew up in the church, I'm a church baby, and one of the songs that the choir used to sing when I was a child was there's a bright side somewhere. <laughs> and they, they would remind us that you got to keep on looking until you find it because there is a bright side somewhere. That's what hope does. Hope cries out in the darkness. <laughs> and hope says there's got to be a bright side somewhere. Hope does not allow you to go through life with your eyes shut. <laughs> Hope says, even if I'm in the dark, I'm going to keep my eyes open because I am looking for some light. I am looking for a bright side. I am looking for things to change. I am looking for things to improve. I am looking for God to make a way. So even in the midst of the pain, there is this presence of hope that is looking for, expecting, anticipating, desiring, welcoming a bright side and improvement to circumstances that are not preferred. All right. It's that belief in that bright side that causes us not to just look for it, 
but look forward to it. Yeah. Another thing that helps us to realize hope is that hope not only comes from pain, but hope also comes from perspective. It comes from perspective. The way you view things, perspective, right? There's some people who seem to be just naturally, innately wired with positivity, that they're just going to find some good in everything, that they're going to find some light in the midst of all darkness, that they're going to find uh, something good out of every bad situation. It seems like some people are just predisposed to that, um, but everybody's not. <laughs> I would dare even say the majority of human beings are not, particularly when unfavorable circumstances have been prolonged and protracted. <laughs> because what happens is, is that Many of us can remain positive and have a good perspective when things first hit, but when things continue and are prolonged and are protracted, then it begins to really affect the quality of our hope. It not only affects the quality of our hope, it can affect the quantity of our hope. Right. Because when life's pains keep coming, I mean, it's one thing for you to be hit. Right. It's another thing for you to be hit over and over and over and over again. I was talking with one of our brothers um, who was serving in our food pantry and I stopped and told him as I was coming into the office uh, from another meeting. I said, uh, I said, hey, bro, said I just want you to know I've been praying for you, been praying for you. You know, this this man, you know, has had multiple deaths back to back to back mother, brother and now daughter. Right. And it's one thing to get hit with one death, but then you get hit with another one and then another one. And each one is related to somebody that has a different, deeper part of your heart. Right. It's one thing, you know, for you to get laid off of your job. It's another thing for you then to get a diagnosis, right, from the doctor's office that says, you know, you could die. And then it's another thing for you not to be able to pay your bills on top of all of that, having lost your job, having gotten a bad diagnosis, right? When you get hit from multiple sides, multiple hits one after the other, it can impact your hope. There's no need in us engaging in... Um, in falsities and no need in us trying to be so spiritual that we deny the impacts of life's pains on our hope. That's one of the reasons that some of you all have tuned in because God wants you to be honest like our ancestors about your pains, right? But he also wants to help your perspective, right? Because hope comes from pain, but it also comes from perspective, because if you can see something differently, if you can see something more positively, have you ever had somebody to show you something and you said, wow, I didn't see it that way, right? What happened? Perspective. And when that perspective was impacted, what happened? Your attitude was impacted. And when your attitude was impacted, your hope was impacted. And when your hope was impacted, your expectation was impacted. Because there are times when we can hear, recite, read, and sing Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 over and over and over again. And it really didn't have much impact on us. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think by the power that's at work within us by Christ Jesus to him be glory in the church throughout all generations world without end. Amen. That's Ephesians chapter three, verse 20 and 21. Right. We can hear it. We can quote it. We can preach it. We can sing it. Right. And it's all good. It's all gravy. Yeah, we believe it. Oh, but when life hits us hard and drops us low <laughs> and that pain won't go away. Those circumstances aren't changing and things are prolonged and protracted. Ooh, do we really believe that he's able 
to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, right? And there are times when we're down in that low place, in that dark place, where we hear that scripture preached or prayed or sung or quoted or whatever it was, that it hits us differently and impacts our perspective, the way we view our situation and the way we view our lives because over time life's pains can cause hope to be not only deferred but diminished where it's less than what it was over time life pains can cause our hope to be diluted you know when something is diluted it has had water to get into it and it is thinner less strong less potent than it was less concentrated than it was before, right? Sometimes life's pains can, can hit us so hard and go on so long that it causes our hope to be damaged, right? Where we stop believing the way we used to believe and we, we don't seem to look forward the way we used to look forward and we just don't see things getting any better and that whole give up itis starts to really get a stronghold on us and then sometimes it would seem that our hopes could even be destroyed. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it felt for Mary, the mother of Jesus, along with the other women and John, Jesus' disciple, who were at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. And after he was crucified and then they saw Nicodemus bury him, <laughs> then their hopes were humanly destroyed, right? Because not only did he die on the cross with all of that suffering, but then they saw him actually buried in a tomb. And the tomb was sealed with the imprimatur, with the royal signet of the Roman emperor. In other words, it was against the law for anybody to touch that stone, right? <laughs> Yet... On a Sunday morning, they went to the tomb, did the women, and they expected to find this body. They were going to figure out who was going to roll the stone away so that they could give him a proper burial and bomb his body as it was supposed to be embalmed. And they were surprised that even when hope is destroyed, <laughs> hope can be resurrected. That was the lesson that Jesus taught Mary and Martha in John chapter 11. By the time Jesus finally got to Bethany, where Lazarus, Mary and Martha resided, Lazarus had not only died, but he had been in the grave four days. And when Jesus said, show me where you laid him, both Mary and Martha had already said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. When Jesus said, show me where you laid him, roll back the stone, Martha said, Lord, by now he stinks. In other words, decomposition has already commenced and that stench of death has already begun to create an unpleasant odoriferous emanation. <laughs> it stinks. <laughs> Jesus said, I ain't ask you all of that because Jesus had just told Martha when she said, Lord, I know I'll see my brother again in the last day in the general resurrection. Jesus said, you talking about looking to a day. You looking at today. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they were dead, yet will they live. And he calls Lazarus back to life. And their hope that had been destroyed in the death of their brother and the delay of their Lord was resurrected. And so I say to you, my brother, I say to you, my sister, allow the Lord to change your perspective. Yeah, that even hopes that have seemingly been destroyed can be resurrected. It is that New Testament scholar, one of my favorites, Dr. N.T. Wright, who was born in Uganda and raised in England, who asserts in his book, Surprised by Hope, that hope has the ability to look beyond our present circumstances 
Hope is what you get when you suddenly realize that a different worldview is possible. A worldview in which the rich, the powerful, and the unscrupulous do not, after all, have the last word. The same worldview shift that is demanded by the resurrection of Jesus is the shift that will enable us to transform the world, end quote. Yeah. And so sometimes because of life's disappointments and our dismay, our perspective can change and become pessimistic, become less than expectant. Martin Luther King Jr. was becoming a bit jaded along the journey before his demise, which we just celebrated, um, or acknowledged, should I say, uh, the anniversary of his, of his death. But he become a little bit jaded along the way. And one of the things that's overlooked in his I Have a Dream speech is that he shared with America that America had written a check that had come back marked insufficient funds. Yeah. In some ways, he was dismayed. In some ways, he was jaded. And yet... Before he closed his message the night before he was gunned down at the Lorraine Motel, he said to them, but I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He still had hope. He still believed in a testament of hope that there was in the body politic of America that had proven up to that point and unfortunately proven beyond to this very point that there was a cancer in its body politic called racism and greed and capitalism that takes no prisoners, right? Yet Martin said there's still some hope. There's still some good in America. And so we have to keep hope alive, right? And that hope is birthed through our pains, but it's also something that comes from our perspective. Hope provokes our imagination, as Dr. Dennis Edwards says, allowing us to envision a world where God's justice reigns, right? Seems like Truth is forever on the scaffold. Wrong is forever on the throne. But that great poet says, ah, oh, but behind the dim unknown stands God. Yeah, who keeps watch over his own, right? And so the perspective that we have to continue to embrace is that no matter how bad things are, no matter how bad things get, no matter how long they've been the way they are, that things can still get better. So I'm led of the Holy Spirit to just insert here um, that for those of you that are being tempted or have yielded to the temptation to give up on or to write off a family member or a friend, don't write them off. As long as the Lord is on the throne and as long as that person is alive, there is still hope. Yeah, they may have been that way for years now. Yeah, they may be stuck like Chuck with no desire to change. Yes, they may be of a certain mindset that just won't seem to let them go. But there's still hope. <laughs> there's still hope. All right. And so another place from which hope comes is not only pain and not only perspective, but also promise. Promise. Now, I could just stay here for 30 minutes by by itself. I won't, but I could because this is where the power of the word of God comes in. Remember, faith and hope are linked together. Right. Well, 
And the Bible says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Bible also says, Romans 10, um, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, right? So the more we hear the word, the more our faith is built and the more our faith is built, the more hope we have, right? And so that means paying attention to the promises of God and embracing, believing those promises that have come from God. And because God is not a man or a woman that God should lie, nor the son of a man or the daughter of a man or a woman that God should repent, then we can count on God's word. Paul says that every word of God in Christ Jesus is yea and amen. You can count on it, right? And so sometimes the way that we strengthen our hope, the way we keep hope alive is to remind ourselves of the promises of God. So for example, from time to time when your hope is real low, you might want to Go back and read Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Yeah. The King James Version says to give you hope and an expected end. (laughs) Yeah. So grab some promises. Grab some promises. When you read Isaiah chapter 41, verse number 10. And when you read Isaiah chapter 43, verse two and three, God reminds God's people that I am the Lord, your God, that I will uphold you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my righteous or mighty right hand. That when you go through the waters, they will not drown you. When you go through the flood, it will not overwhelm you. When you go through the fires, it will not burn you. When you go through the flames, it will not send you because I, the Lord, your God, am your God. Right? So you got to grab some promises. Right? And these promises are promises from God because promises from women and from men will let you down and disappoint you because they themselves cannot always keep their word. But God always keeps God's word. Whatever God promises God will do, God indeed will do. Right. So, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Right. Psalm 23, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Later on, the writer would say that even if my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will bear me up. Yeah. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Right. And so you start looking at the promises of God throughout the word of God and holding on to those promises and you'll discover hope will come alive in you because you can't read the promises of God. You can't quote the promises of God continually without them impacting your levels of expectation, without them impacting your levels of hopefulness. Yeah, the more you recite them, the more you believe them, the more you read them, the more you hear them, the more you sing them, then the more you loosen the grip of despair on your soul so that hope experiences a door to a cage in which it was previously locked that is open so that it can fly out and it can experience the things that God has. All right. And then, of course, ultimately, then that means that hope not only comes from pain, perspective, from promise, but also a person. And that person is almighty God, God's self. All right. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So uh, write this down when you get an opportunity. Um, I'll quote them for you. But first Peter, chapter one, verse 21 says through him. You believe in God who raised him from the dead, referring to Jesus, and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. 
To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right? Professor Dennis Edwards contends that the experience, to experience the full power of hope, it must be accompanied by faith in God, the ultimate source of hope. So our hope ultimately comes from God. It comes from the Lord, and therefore the Lord God is the ultimate object of our hope, that we ultimately put our hope in God. All right? That's what we do. And as we find hope, it's our responsibility to share hope with others who have none. It was uh, late Professor Dennis Sleeby who wrote, sometimes we have to lend hope to others until they can find it for themselves. <laughs> sometimes we have to lend hope to others until they can find it for themselves. The Lord laid it upon my heart the other day to call one of my friends that I know is going through a difficult time. And I called and I said, hey, I just called to lend you some hope because I know you don't have much for yourself right now. But I have hope <laughs> that our God is going to get you through this tough season in your life. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, <laughs> you have to lend hope to other people around you that don't have any, that are in total despair. And then God will turn around in other seasons when you have little or no hope and cause someone else to lend you their hope because you don't have any for yourself, all right? No matter how bad things are, you can embrace that hope and you can become a conduit of hope. Here it is, I'll move toward a close with this. Um, I, I came across a book through a friend of mine um, last year and it's a book that focuses on the science of hope. And in that book, um, they tell a story about a brother by the name of Amika Inmake. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, and Emike, if I'm not, please forgive me. He's an uh, African-born brother from Nigeria. And uh, Emike watched his life change before him. Emike was playing football, game that he loved and fell in love with. And as he was playing football, something happened. Before things got started, he was all excited, all psyched up, ready to go. He watched the ball fly into the air as the ball was kicked off to begin the game. He zeroed in, and as he caught the ball, the returner, he started shedding the returners, the tackles, the first tackle he shed, another one he threw off with a block. He has the ball, he received it, he's running back down the field, and all of a sudden, here comes another player headed towards him at full speed, and Emike, um, finds himself wrapped up. He seeks to wrap up the other fellow. And what happens is, is that Emike experiences a collision. Two players, one catches the ball, the other one tries to tackle him. All of a sudden, there was a collision. The entire stadium heard the collision like two ram's horns, right? And Emike um, is the one who was actually on defense rather than offense. And he tackled the fella, right? And as he tackled him, something happened. He felt a stinging sensation all over his body. As a result, he fell to the ground and he did not feel his body fall when it fell. You know exactly what happened. This six foot four inch, 245, 40 pound defensive player fell to the ground 
and would never play football again because an injury was experienced at the age of 19. A Nigerian immigrant's career playing semi-pro football in Oklahoma ended in one play at the beginning of the game. As a result, Mike didn't know how his body would respond. He tried to get up. The entire stadium was silent. He was on the field for an hour and 18 minutes before the ambulance finally arrived. He felt distant from the voices that he heard around him, people working on his body. They finally rolled him off the field, right? And he wanted to give a thumbs up because he saw other players when they were heard on TV, you know, give a thumbs up as they were being carted off the field. But he was paralyzed and he couldn't even do that. He couldn't even raise his thumbs. And so after weeks in the hospital, he began a long road of recovery through physical therapy and his argument with God, which was why me, right? The pain of this experience emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and physically caused him to be in despair. And so he was arguing with God, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? All right? Many of us have asked that question at certain junctures. So he was faced with one of the greatest blows imaginable in his life. As he looked back on it, Mike says his biggest trial was his greatest blessing. Did you hear that? His greatest trial, paralysis, was his greatest blessing. Through his faith in God, he found the motivation to begin setting new goals and finding new pathways to his goals. And today, Amike is a motivational speaker, a life coach, a hope advocate, and he has refocused himself so that he's refused to let his injury define him. Yeah, he began to see himself as a piece of coal that survived great amounts of pressure so as to become a diamond. And today, he says, I am a diamond. As a result, he's concluded and tells others, hope is not a step in life, it is a stance. In other words, it's something that you decide you're going to be hopeful no matter what. He has become a beacon of hope around uh, the world and for other people around him. And he shares this message of hope that even when life goes terribly wrong, that you can still have hope and you can still live out what it means to be an expression of hope. That means you have to learn to hope against hope. And so I close uh, today by simply saying to you, brother and sister, hope can come from pain. It can come from perspective. It can come from promise. And ultimately, it comes from a person. That person is God. And when life happens in devastating ways, don't allow what happened to you to destroy the hope that's inside of you. Because God is still God. And God is still able. <laughs> I remember coming across many years ago a little story about a man who approached a little boy uh, and his team that were playing Little League Baseball. And so the man approached the dugout. And uh, when he looked into the dugout, he saw the little boy on the bench. The rest of the players were out on the field. And um, little boy was asked by the old man, he said, what's the score? <laughs> and the little boy said, uh, 18 to nothing, we're behind. <laughs> the man looked back at the boy, he said, boy, I bet you're discouraged. <laughs> and the little boy looked back at the man and he said, why should I be discouraged? We haven't even gotten up to bat yet. <laughs> it was the first inning, they were being beaten unmercifully, 18 to nothing. But the little boy's perspective was that we haven't even gotten up to bat yet. Let me tell you, no matter how bad things are, it ain't over until it's over because you got a God who may not have even gotten up to bat yet, who can get up and who can cause you to still win in spite of 
otherwise losing situations. And so embrace hope as that which James H. Cohn, my late professor of theology and the father of black theology from Union Theological Seminary, wrote in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. He says, hope is carved out of a tenacious spirit, the stubborn refusal to be defeated by tragedy. And so that's where we end today, because somebody has experienced tragedy in your life, like Amika. Somebody's experienced great despair and disappointment in your life. And God says to you, allow hope to keep you alive, because hope is that tenacious spirit, that stubborn refusal to be defeated by tragedy. And so embrace your hope because while hope deferred makes the heart sick, Solomon also says, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. So embrace life. Keep hope alive. Keep believing that there's a bright side somewhere and watch what God does. And God may not do it overnight. But over time, if you can keep believing, keep hoping, keep looking, then God's going to show you that your hope was not in vain. And so be encouraged. Keep hope alive and watch hope keep you alive. In the weeks to come, we're going to talk some more about hope and we're going to look a little bit into the science of hope. But we're more so going to look into examples of hope through the scriptures and identify some characters in scriptures that become examples for us that we can borrow from. Be blessed church. If you're not a Christian, I want you to know that your ultimate hope is in God who loved you so much that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, rose from the grave for your victory. And it's because of his resurrection that we can be confident that our hope in him will never be in vain. And so if you're not a Christian but want to become one, just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are God's son who died for my sins and rose for my victory. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Be my savior. And my Lord, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations, you're now a Christian. You moved out of religion into relationship. And now your hope, your greatest hope has just been realized in Jesus Christ. And so we encourage you to send us an email. Let us know you made that decision. If by chance you've been out of church, you haven't been connected. You haven't been in a Bible study. You haven't been in a fellowship. You haven't been in worship. You're just disconnected. But you tuned in today and you today have made a decision by the Holy Spirit that you're not going to allow despair or disappointment or disenchantment or diminishment or anything else in your life to keep you from your hope. And you know that you need to be connected to a church family. We'd love to have you as a part of our family. Send us an email. It's on the screen to let us know that you want to become a part of our family of Mount Calvary on your Christian experience. And if by chance you want to worship God through giving today to just tell the Lord, thank you for your goodness or to give God God's tithes or to share gifts of love and gifts of support, then we encourage you to follow the prompts for digital giving or simply mail your gifts into the church or bring them with you on Sunday morning. Look forward to seeing you next week. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be back and we'll be full of hope and ready to pour some hope into you so that you can keep hope alive and see how hope will keep you alive too. Grace and peace. Yesterday, the Young Adult Ministry gathered for a brunch that was more than just a meal. It was a time of spiritual fellowship. Laughter filled the rooms as conversation about the ministry were had and dreams were shared about the future plans for the ministry. Anyone between the ages of 21 to 35 who would like to become a part of the Young Adult Ministry or see what's on the agenda for the future should send an email to youngadults at mcbcfs.org.
This Saturday, join the senior ministry for some good old fashioned down home fun, playing cards, dominoes, chess, checkers, and other board games at the Game Day and Potluck Fellowship. Meet us in the Fellowship Hall from 11.30 a.m. to 3 o'clock p.m. We invite adults of all ages to join us. To sign up to attend or bring a dish, visit the table in the lobby. You can also email Reverend Adrian King at seniorministry at mcbcfs.org. We look forward to having a great time fellowshipping with you. As we prepare for our National Baby Shower, the Evangelism Missions Division is receiving donations. They ask for new and gender neutral items, including onesies, hats, socks, blankets, diapers, car seats, high chairs, bibs, bottles, and other baby essentials. We will also accept gift cards and monetary donations. Our National Baby Shower will take place on Saturday, April 27th from 10 a.m. until 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time in our Fairfield Campus Sanctuary and on Zoom. Registration is required. To register, please visit our website and click on the National Baby Shower graphic or send an email to nbs at mcbcfs.org. In celebration of Mother's Day, the young adults are hosting a paint night on Thursday, May 9th from 6 p.m. until 8 p.m. at the True Symmetry Brewing Company, located at 315 Marina Center in Sassoon City. This would be a fun time for all who attend. To purchase tickets, visit www.mcbcfs.org and click on the paint night graphic to secure your tickets through Eventbrite. There will be no tickets sold at the door. This is a 21 and up event. Get your tickets now. Attention high school seniors. Scholarship application season is upon us and we may have a scholarship for you. If you have been an active member of Mount Calvary for a minimum of one year with a minimum of a 2.5 GPA, you may be eligible for a college scholarship. The application deadline is Tuesday, April 30th. For more information and to apply, visit Mount Calvary's webpage at www.mcbcfs.org and click on the scholarship banner or call the scholarship ministry at 707-399-2496. Hey family, on Thursday, May 2nd, we will take part in the National Day of Prayer via Zoom at 12 noon Pacific time. The theme for this year is Lift Up the Word, Light Up the World. You can join by visiting our webpage at www.mcbcfs.org and clicking on the National Day of Prayer banner. Again, that's Thursday, May 2nd at 12 noon Pacific time. So mark your calendar. Hey, Mount Calvary, as we prepare for Vacation Bible School and summer tutoring, we are looking for servants to help with teaching, administration, food distribution, and other general help. If you are interested in serving for either program, visit our webpage at www.mcbcfs.org and click on the Vacation Bible School graphic or summer tutoring graphic. We look forward to working with you to help make our summer programs a success. This has been your MCBC News. For more information, visit our website at www.mcbcfs.org.